The Important Dates in History Iceberg, as the name says, is an iceberg full of important dates throughout history. Some of the dates are easy to identify at a first glance, such as 9-11, but others are more obscure and needs a little more digging to be done in order to figure out what happened on that day. I like reading up on random events throughout history, and not knowing the names of these events and only having a date to look at them by really caught my eye, so I decided to make an iceberg video on it. I can't think of any proper ranking system for this iceberg, as these events have happened and are already ranked by obscurity, so we'll just go ahead and take things as the way they are. For those of you that don't know what an iceberg is, it's a type of tier list. Things at the top are surface level and more well known, and the deeper you go, the more obscure and less known or understood the topics become. All the sources that I use will be in the description below if you would like to read more into a certain subject. We'll be starting from the top. Are you guys ready? It's time to take a dive into the important dates iceberg. Here we go. September 11th, 2001. The September 11th attacks. On September 11th, 2001, at 8.45 a.m. Tuesday morning, an American Airlines Boeing 767 loaded up with 2,000 gallons of jet fuel crashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center in New York City. 18 minutes after the first plane hit, a second Boeing 767, United Airlines Flight 175, appeared out of the sky, turned sharply toward the World Trade Center, and crashed into the South Tower. The South Tower would collapse 15 minutes later, as the steel structure was melting due to the burning jet fuel. At 10.30 a.m., the North Tower would collapse as well, killing thousands. Only six people in the tower survived the collapse. As millions watched these events unfold in New York City, American Airlines Flight 77 circled over downtown Washington, D.C. before crashing into the west side of the Pentagon military headquarters at 9.45 a.m. Jet fuel from the Boeing 757 caused a devastating inferno that led to the structural collapse of a portion of the giant concrete building, which is the headquarters of the United States Department of Defense. All total, 125 military personnel and civilians were killed in the Pentagon, along with 64 people aboard the airliner. Flight 93 was hijacked 40 minutes after taking off from the Newark Liberty International Airport. Passengers on the plane had learned of what happened in New York and Washington already as the plane had been delayed from taking off. As their own flight was hijacked and the hijackers claimed that they were going back to the airport to demand ransom, they soon realized that this wasn't the case and they started planning an insurrection. Flight attendant Sandy Bradshaw called her husband and told him that they were filling pitchers of boiling water. Her last words to him were, everyone's running to first class, I've got to go, bye. The plane would crash in a rural field near Shanksville in western Pennsylvania at 10.10 a.m. All 44 passengers were killed on impact. The intended target for the plane is still unknown to this day. No one knows if the passengers were able to get into the cockpit as planned, but their courageous act of heroism will never be forgotten. July 4th, 1776, America declares its independence from Great Britain. On July 4th, 1776, America officially declared its independence from Great Britain. The American Revolution was caused by the constant acts being used to tax the American people, such as the Stamp Act of 1765, the Townsend Act of 1767, and the Tea Act of 1773. Resistance of these acts will culminate in two major events, the Boston Massacre in 1770 and the Boston Tea Party in 1773. On September 1774, George Washington, John and Samuel Adams, Patrick Henry and John Jay met in Philadelphia to voice their grievances against the British rule. They denounced taxation without representation. Congress voted to meet again in May 1775, but by that time the fighting had already begun. On the night of April 18, 1775, hundreds of British troops marched from Boston to nearby Concord, Massachusetts in order to seize an arms cache. Paul Revere and other Knight Riders sounded the alarm, and the colonial militiamen were beginning to mobilize to intercept the Redcoats. On April 19th, local militiamen clashed with the British soldiers in the battles of Lexington and Concord in Massachusetts, marking the shot heard around the world that signified the start of the Revolutionary War. The Revolutionary War would go on for years to come, with fights such as the Battle of Bunker Hill, the Battle of Saratoga, and the Battle of Yorktown being the defining moments throughout the eight-year period of fighting. In late 1782, Britain pulled out the rest of its troops from America, and on September 3rd, 1783, Britain officially recognized the United States as an independent country in the Treaty of Paris, bringing the American Revolution to a close. May 7th, 1945, D 
the end of World War II in Europe. On May 7, 1945, the German High Command, in the person of General Alfred Jodl, signs the unconditional surrender of all German forces, east and west, at Reims in northeastern France. At first, General Jodl hoped to limit the terms of the German surrender to only those forces still fighting the Western Allies. But General Dwight Eisenhower demanded the complete surrender of all German forces, those fighting in the east as well as the west. If this demand was not met, Eisenhower was prepared to seal off the Western Front, preventing Germans from fleeing to the West in order to surrender, thereby leaving them in the hands of the enveloping Soviet forces. Yodel radioed Grand Admiral Karl Dunitz, Hitler's successor, with the terms. Dunitz ordered him to sign. So with Russian General Ivan Suslopatov and French General Francois Savez signing as witnesses and General Walter Bedell Smith, Chief of Staff, signing for the Allied Expeditionary Force, Germany was at least on paper defeated. Fighting would still go on in the east for almost another day, but the war in the west was over. Since General Suslopatov did not have the explicit permission from the Soviet Premier Stalin to sign the surrender papers, even as a witness, he was quickly hustled back east and into the hands of the Soviet secret police. Alfred Jodl, who was wounded in the assassination attempt on Hitler on July 20th, 1944, would be found guilty of war crimes, which included the shooting of hostages, at Nuremberg and hanged on October 16th, 1946. He was later granted a pardon, posthumously, in 1953, after a German appeals court found him not guilty of breaking international law. September 1st, 1939, World War II begins. On September 1st, 1939, World War II had officially begun. The instability created in Europe by the First World War set the stage for another international conflict, World War II, which broke out only two decades later and were proved to be even more devastating. Rising to power in an economically and politically unstable Germany, Adolf Hitler, leader of the Nazi party, rearmed the nation and signed strategic treaties with Italy and Japan to further his ambitions of world domination. Hitler's invasion of Poland on September 1, 1939 drove Great Britain and France to declare war on Germany, marking the beginning of World War II. Over the next six years, the conflict would take more lives and destroy more land and property around the globe than any previous war. Among the estimated 45 to 60 million people killed were 6 million Jews murdered in Nazi concentration camps as part of Hitler's diabolical Final Solution Plan, now known as the Holocaust. November 22, 1963, the assassination of John F. Kennedy. On November 22, 1963, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the 35th President of the United States of America, is assassinated while traveling through Dallas, Texas in an open-top convertible. First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy rarely accompanied her husband on political outings, but she was beside him, along with Texas Governor John Connolly and his wife, for a 10-mile motorcade through the streets of downtown Dallas on November 22nd. Sitting in a Lincoln convertible, the Kennedys and the Connollys waved at the large and enthusiastic crowds gathered along the parade route. As their vehicle passed the Texas School Book Depository building at 12.30pm, Lee Harvey Oswald allegedly fired three shots from the sixth floor, fatally wounding President Kennedy and seriously injuring Governor Connolly. Kennedy was pronounced dead 30 minutes later at the Dallas Parkland Hospital. He was 46 years old. Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson was sworn in as the 36th President of the United States at 2.39 p.m. He took the presidential oath of office aboard Air Force One as it sat on the runway at Dallas Love Field Airport. The swearing in was witnessed by some 30 people, including Jacqueline Kennedy, who was still wearing the clothes stained with her husband's blood. Seven minutes later, the presidential jet took off for Washington. Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested just a few hours after killing Kennedy. On November 24th, while being transferred to another jail, he was shot and killed by Jack Ruby, enraged by what Oswald had done. Some call Jack a hero, but he was nonetheless charged with first degree murder. December 7th, 1941, the attack on Pearl Harbor. On December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor was attacked by Japanese forces. At 7.55 a.m., a swarm of 360 Japanese dive warplanes came out of the clouds and descended on the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor. Much of the Pacific fleet was rendered useless by this attack. Five of eight battleships, three destroyers, and seven other ships were sunk or severely damaged, and more than 200 aircraft were destroyed. A total of 2,400 Americans were killed and 1,200 were wounded, many while valiantly attempting to repulse the attack. 
The day after Pearl Harbor was bombed, President Franklin D. Roosevelt appeared before a joint session of Congress and asked them to approve a resolution recognizing the state of war between the United States and Japan. The Senate voted for war against Japan by 82 to 0, and the House of Representatives approved the resolution by a vote of 388 to 1. Three days later, Germany and Italy declared war against the United States, and the US government responded in kind. The United States would get its revenge on Japan six months later at the Battle of Midway, turning the tide against the previously thought to be invincible Japanese naval force. April 6, 1945, the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. Since the 1940s, the United States had been working on an atomic weapon after being warned that Nazi Germany was working on one of their own. The United States had conducted their first successful test in July 1945, but Germany had been defeated by then. President Harry Truman was warned that if they were to invade Japan again, there would be heavy American casualties. After hearing all of this, Truman decided that it was time to use the weapon. On August 6, 1945, the American bomber Enola Gay dropped a 5-ton bomb over the Japanese city of Hiroshima. A blast equivalent to the power of 15 tons of TNT reduced 4 square miles of the city to ruins and immediately killed 80,000 people. Tens of thousands more died in the following weeks from wounds and radiation poisoning. Three days later, on August 9th, another bomb was dropped on the city of Nagasaki, killing nearly 40,000 more people. A few days later, Japan announced its surrender. World War II was officially over. The estimated number of those killed range from 129,000 to 226,000, though the true number will never be for certain. June 6, 1944, the Normandy Landings. During World War II, the Battle of Normandy, which lasted from June 1944 to August 1944, resulted in the Allied liberation of Western Europe from Nazi Germany's control. Codenamed Operation Overlord, the battle began on June 6, 1944 also known as D-Day, when some 156,000 American, British, and Canadian forces landed on the five beaches along the 50-mile stretch of the heavily fortified coast of France's Normandy region. The invasion was one of the largest amphibious military assaults in history and required extensive planning. Prior to D-Day, the Allies conducted a large-scale deception campaign designed to mislead the Germans about the intended invasion target. By late August 1944, all of northern France had been liberated, and by the following spring the Allies had defeated the German forces. The Normandy landings had been called the beginning of the end of the war in Europe. A realistic depiction of these events transpired in the movie Saving Private Ryan, which I highly recommend for those of you who want to see what the true horror was like landing on those beaches. July 20th, 1969, the Apollo 11 moon landing. On July 20th, 1969, American astronauts Neil Armstrong and Edwin Buzz Aldrin became the first humans to ever land on the moon. About six and a half hours later, Armstrong became the first person to walk on the moon. As he took his first step, Armstrong famously said, That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The Apollo 11 mission occurred eight years after President John F. Kennedy announced a national goal of landing a man on the moon by the end of the 1960s. Apollo 17, the final manned moon mission, took place in 1972. The Apollo program was a costly and labor-intensive endeavor, involving an estimated 400,000 engineers, technicians, and scientists, and costing $24 billion, close to $100 billion in today's dollars. The expense was justified by Kennedy's 1961 mandate to beat the Soviets to the moon, and after that feat was accomplished, ongoing missions lost their viability. November 9, 1989 The Fall of the Berlin Wall On November 9, 1989, as the Cold War began to thaw across Eastern Europe, the spokesman for East Berlin's Communist Party announced a change in his city's relations with the West. Starting at midnight that day, he said, citizens of the GDR were free to cross the country's borders. East and West Berliners flocked to the wall, drinking beer and champagne and chanting, Tor Uf, open the gate. At midnight, they flooded through the checkpoints. More than 2 million people from East Berlin visited West Berlin that weekend to participate in the celebration that was, as one journalist wrote, the greatest street party in the history of the world. People used hammers and picks to knock away chunks of the wall, 
They became known as Mauschweck, or wall woodpeckers, while cranes and bulldozers pulled down section after section. Soon, the wall was gone, and Berlin was united for the first time since 1945. Only today, one Berliner spray painted on a piece of wall, is the war really over. November 11th, 1918, the end of World War I. By the end of autumn 1918, the Alliance of the Central Powers was unraveling in its war effort against the better supplied and coordinated Allied Powers. Facing exhausted resources on the battlefield, turmoil on the home front, and the surrender of its weaker allies, Austria-Hungary, Bulgaria, and the Ottoman Empire, Germany was finally forced to seek an armistice with the Allies in the early days of November 1918. On November 7th, the German Chancellor, Prince Max von Baden, sent delegates to Compain, France to negotiate the agreement. It was signed at 5.10 a.m. on the morning of November 11th. World War I was known as the war to end all wars because of the great slaughter and destruction it caused. Unfortunately, the peace treaty that officially ended the conflict, the Treaty of Versailles of 1919, forced punitive terms on Germany that destabilized Europe and laid the groundwork for World War II. April 14, 1865, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. John Wilkes Booth was a Maryland native born in 1838 into a family of noted actors. Booth would eventually take the stage himself, appearing in 1855 in Shakespeare's Richard III in Baltimore. Booth was sympathetic toward the Confederates, and he had a plan that would help save the Confederacy before it was too late. Learning that Lincoln was to attend Laura Keene's acclaimed performance of Our American Cousin at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. on April 14, 1865, Booth masterminded a plan so sinister it would change American history forever. At 10.15 p.m., Booth slipped into Lincoln's private theater box and fired his 44 caliber single-shot pistol into the back of Lincoln's head. At first, the crowd interpreted the unfolding drama as part of the production, but a scream from the First Lady told them otherwise. Although Booth broke his leg from falling out of the box, he managed to leave the theater and escape from Washington on horseback. Several soldiers carried Lincoln to a boarding house across the street and placed him on a bed. When the Surgeon General arrived at the house, he concluded that Lincoln could not be saved and would probably die during the night. Abraham Lincoln was pronounced dead at 7.22 a.m. on April 15, 1865, at the age of 56. On April 18th, Lincoln's body was carried to the Capitol Rotunda to lay in state on the catafalque. Three days later, his remains were boarded on a train that conveyed him to Springfield, Illinois, where he had lived before becoming president. The man who was considered the greatest American president to ever live was no more, and American history would be changed forever. June 28th, 1914, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife, Sophie Chotek, were on a visit to Sarajevo, Bosnia-Herzegovina, to oversee a series of military exercises. Upon learning of Ferdinand's upcoming visit, the young Bosnians, a secret revolutionary society of peasant students, began plotting to assassinate him. Ferdinand and Sophie departed their estate for Bosnia-Herzegovina on July 23rd. He was well aware of the risks, but refused to cancel the trip. After arriving at a spa town a few miles outside of Sarajevo, Ferdinand attended two days of military exercises while Sophie visited schools and orphanages. Following a banquet with religious and political leaders, only one day of events remained before Ferdinand and Sophie were to return home. The first assassination attempt was thwarted when a young Bosnian named Nedeliko Kadbinovic's bomb bounced off the top of the folded up roof and rolled underneath the wrong vehicle, injuring some soldiers and bystanders. He then tried to kill himself swallowing a cyanide pill and jumping in a riverbed, but the old cyanide only induced vomiting and the riverbed was virtually dried up due to a particularly hot summer. He was subsequently dragged out of the river and beaten before being taken into custody. The second assassination attempt happened when Ferdinand insisted on visiting the injured soldiers and during the car ride to the hospital a wrong turn was made, stopping right in front of the eventual assassin, Gavriel Princip. As the motorcade prepared to turn back around, Princip pulled out his gun and shot Ferdinand in the neck and hit Sophie in the abdomen. Ferdinand's last words were, Sophie, Sophie, don't die. Stay alive for our children. However, within minutes, both were dead. Princip was arrested and given a 20-year sentence, but contracted tuberculosis and died in jail in April 1918 at the age of 23. 
With tensions already running high among Europe's greatest powers, the assassination precipitated a rapid descent into World War I. First, Austria-Hungary gained German support for punitive action against Serbia. It then sent Serbia an ultimatum, worded in a way that made acceptance unlikely. Serbia proposed arbitration to resolve the dispute, but Austria-Hungary instead declared war on July 28, 1914, exactly a month after Ferdinand's death. By the following week, Germany, Russia, France, Belgium, Montenegro, and Great Britain had all been drawn into the conflict, and other countries like the United States would enter later. Overall, more than 9 million soldiers and nearly that many civilians would die in the fighting that lasted until 1918. July 7th, 2005, The London Bombings On the morning of July 7th, 2005, bombs were detonated in three crowded London subways and one bus during the peak of the city's rush hour. The synchronized suicide bombings, which were thought to be the work of Al-Qaeda, killed 56 people, including the bombers, and injured another 700. It was the largest attack on Great Britain since World War II. No warning was given to anyone. The train bombings targeted the London Underground, the city's subway system. Nearly simultaneous explosions at about 8.50 am occurred on trains in three locations, between the Aldgate and Liverpool Street stations on the Circle Line, between the Russell Square and King's Cross stations on the Piccadilly Line, and at the Edgware Road Station, also on the Circle Line. Almost an hour later, a double-decker bus on Upper Woburn Place near Tavistock Square was also hit. The bus's roof was ripped off by the blast. Of the four suicide bombers, three were born in Great Britain and one in Jamaica. Three lived in or near Leeds in West Yorkshire. One resided in Aylesbury in Buckinghamshire. Al-Qaeda officially claimed responsibility for the attacks on September 1, 2005 in a videotape released to the Al Jazeera television network. June 4, 1989, the Tiananmen Square Massacre in May 1989, nearly a million Chinese, mostly young students, crowded into central Beijing to protest for greater democracy and call for the resignations of Chinese Communist Party leaders deemed too repressive. For nearly three weeks, the protesters kept up daily vigils and marched enchanted. Western reporters captured much of the drama for television and newspaper audiences in the United States and Europe. On June 4, 1989, however, Chinese troops and security police stormed through Tiananmen Square, firing indiscriminately into the crowds of protesters. Turmoil ensued as tens of thousands of young students tried to escape the rampaging Chinese forces. Other protesters fought back, stoning the attacking troops and overturning and setting fire to military vehicles. Reporters and Western diplomats on the scene estimated that at least 300 and perhaps thousands of protesters had been killed and as many as 10,000 were arrested. The savagery of the Chinese government's attack shocked both its allies and Cold War enemies. Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev declared that he was saddened by the events in China. He said he hoped that the government would adopt his own domestic reform program and begin to democratize the Chinese political system. In the United States, editorial lists and members of Congress denounced the Tiananmen Square massacre and pressed for President George H.W. Bush to punish the Chinese government. A little more than three weeks later, the US Congress voted to impose economic sanctions against the People's Republic of China in response to the brutal violation of human rights. January 6, 2021 The Storming of the United States Capitol On January 6, 2021, protesters stormed the US Capitol in an attempt to overturn Donald Trump's defeat in the 2020 presidential election. The rioting led to the evacuation and lockdown of the Capitol and five deaths. For weeks, former President Donald Trump had urged his supporters to go to Washington to stop the certification of the election results, and several simultaneous rallies were planned for that day. Donald Trump starts to give his speech, urging his supporters to show strength and calls his supporters to walk down Pennsylvania Avenue towards the Capitol. The ever-growing mob keeps gaining more and more ground as the Senate debates inside, unaware to the severity of the situation. The mob eventually gets into the Capitol building as the Senate is called to recess and to take cover. The mob storms the building, destroying doors and stealing whatever they could get their hands on, such as Nancy Pelosi's laptop and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's shoes. The mob was cleared out of the building by mid-evening, and a week later Donald Trump was impeached a second time for incitement of insurrection, making him the only US president to be impeached twice. July 1st, 1867 Canada gains its independence. During the 19th century, colonial dependence gave way to increasing autonomy for growing Canada. 
In 1841, Upper and Lower Canada, now known as Ontario and Quebec, were made a single province by the Act of Union. In the 1860s, a movement for a greater Canadian federation grew out of the need for a common defense, the desire for a national railroad system, and the necessity of finding a solution to the problem of French and British conflict. When the maritime provinces, which sought union among themselves, called a conference in 1864, delegates from other provinces of Canada attended. Later in the year, another conference was held in Quebec, and in 1866, Canadian representatives traveled to London to meet with the British government. On July 1, 1867, with the passage of the British North America Act, the Dominion of Canada was officially established as a self-governing entity within the British Empire. Two years later, Canada acquired the vast possessions of the Hudson's Bay Company, and within a decade the provinces of Manitoba and Prince Edward Island had joined in the Canadian Federation. In 1885, the Canadian Pacific Railway was completed, making mass settlement across the vast territory of Canada possible. March 8, 2014 the disappearance of the Malaysia Airlines Flight 370. On March 8, 2014, Malaysia Airlines Flight 370, carrying 227 passengers and 12 crew members, loses contact with air traffic control less than an hour after taking off from Kuala Lumpur, then veers off course and disappears. Most of the plane and everyone on board are never seen again. The plane departed from Kuala Lumpur International Airport at 12.41 a.m and was scheduled to arrive in Beijing Capital International Airport at 6.30 a.m. local time. However, at 1.07 a.m., the aircraft's last automated position report was sent, and at 1.19 a.m., what turned out to be the final voice transmission from the cockpit of the doomed jetliner was relayed to the air traffic controllers. Good night, Malaysia 370, a message that suggested nothing out of the ordinary. About an hour after Flight 370 was scheduled to land in Beijing, Malaysia Airlines announced it was missing. Prior to the aircraft's mysterious disappearance, it had been flying seemingly without incident. There were no distress signals from the plane or reports of bad weather or technical problems. The investigation started immediately, and a week later on March 15th, investigators said that the satellite transmissions indicated Flight 370 had turned sharply off its assigned course and flown west over the Indian Ocean, operating on its own for 5 hours or more. On March 24th, Malaysia's Prime Minister announced the flight was presumed lost somewhere in the Indian Ocean, with no survivors. Multiple countries pitched in to help find the aircraft, gaining global media attention in the process. The most plausible theory is that the reason the flight veered off course was due to the crew turning on autopilot and becoming unresponsive due to hypoxia, or oxygen lost, sometime before the plane crashed. Throughout 2015 and 2016, debris from the aircraft washed ashore on the western Indian Ocean. But the fate of Flight 370 remains a mystery to this very day. March 15th, 44 BC, the assassination of Julius Caesar. On March 15th, 44 BC, Julius Caesar was stabbed to death in Rome, Italy. Caesar was the dictator of the Roman Republic, and his assassins were the Roman senators, fellow politicians who helped shape Roman policy and government. Julius Caesar was immensely popular with the people of Rome. He was a successful military leader who expanded the Republic to include parts of what are now Spain, France, Germany, Switzerland, and Belgium. Caesar was also a popular author who wrote about his travels, theories, and political views. Many members of the Senate, a group of appointed, not elected, political leaders, resented Caesar's popularity and arrogance. After Caesar attained the status of dictator for life in 44 BC, these officials decided to strike the ultimate blow against his power. A group of as many as 60 conspirators decided to assassinate Caesar at the meeting of the Senate on March 15th, the Ides of March. Collectively, the group stabbed Caesar reported 23 times, killing the Roman leader. The death of Julius Caesar ultimately had the opposite impact of what the assassins hoped. Much of the Roman public hated the senators for the assassination, and a series of civil wars ensued. In the end, Caesar's grandnephew and adoptive son Octavian emerged as Rome's leader. He renamed himself Augustus Caesar and showed no mercy on those who killed his father. The reign of Augustus marked the end of the Roman Republic and the start of the Roman Empire. March 11, 2011 The Tohoku Earthquake and Tsunami On March 11, 2011, Japan experienced the strongest earthquake in its recorded history. The earthquake struck below the North Pacific Ocean, 130 kilometers east of Sendai, the largest city in the Tohoku region, a northern part of the island of Honshu. The Tohoku earthquake caused a tsunami, a powerful wave caused by the displacement of a body of water. 
The Tohoku tsunami produced waves of up to 40 meters high, with more than 450,000 people becoming homeless as a result of the tsunami. More than 15,500 people died. The tsunami also severely crippled the infrastructure of the country. In addition to the thousands of destroyed homes, businesses, roads, and railways, the tsunamis called the meltdown of three nuclear reactors at the Fukushima Dashi nuclear power plant. The Fukushima nuclear disaster released toxic, radioactive materials into the environment and forced thousands of people to evacuate their homes and businesses. April 26, 1986, the Chernobyl disaster. Chernobyl was a nuclear power plant in Ukraine that was the site of a disastrous nuclear accident on April 26, 1986. A routine test at the power plant went horribly wrong, and two massive explosions blew the 1,000 ton roof off one of the plant's reactors, releasing 400 times more radiation than the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The worst nuclear disaster in history killed two workers in the explosions and, within months, at least 28 more would be dead by acute radiation exposure. Eventually, thousands of people would show signs of health effects, including cancer, from the radioactive fallout. A routine exercise to test if an emergency water cooling system will work went awry and cause a steam buildup in Reactor 4. The steam blasted the roof off the reactor, releasing plumes of radiation and chunks of burning radioactive debris. A second explosion from Reactor 3 happened a few seconds later, caused by a fire on the roof. Firefighters arrived on scene within minutes without any gear to protect them from the radiation. The radiation smog would make its way into Pripyat and through other parts of Europe. It wasn't until two days later on April 28th did the Kremlin report that there was an accident at Chernobyl and that authorities were on the case. On May 14th, Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev began the Chernobyl liquidation, gathering thousands of citizens to help with the cleanup effort. A well-known instance of this was the cleanup of the debris on top of the roof of Chernobyl, with the liquidators only having 90 seconds to work before leaving the site and never stepping foot there ever again. Over a hurried construction period of 206 days, crews erected a steel and cement sarcophagus to entomb the damaged reactors and contain any further release of radiation. In 2010, a more secure containment piece started to be built, and was completed and slid over the top of the original sarcophagus in November of 2016. The Chernobyl disaster not only stoked fears over the dangers of nuclear power, it also exposed the Soviet government's lack of openness to the Soviet people and the international community. The meltdown and its aftermath drained the Soviet Union of billions in cleanup costs, led to the loss of primary energy source, and dealt serious blow to national pride. April 15, 1912 The Sinking of the Titanic The RMS Titanic, a luxury steamship, sank in the early hours of April 15, 1912, off the coast of Newfoundland in the North Atlantic after sideswiping an iceberg during its maiden voyage. Of the 2,240 passengers and crew on board, more than 1,500 lost their lives in the disaster. The Titanic has inspired countless books, articles, and films, and the ship's story has entered public consciousness as a cautionary tale about the perils of human hubris. On April 14th, at about 11.30pm, a lookout saw an iceberg coming out of a slight haze dead ahead, then rang the warning bell and telephoned the bridge. The engines were quickly reversed, and the ship was turned sharply. Instead of making direct impact, Titanic seemed to graze along the side of the berg, sprinkling ice fragments on the forward deck. Sensing no collision, the lookouts were relieved. However, they had no idea that the iceberg had a jagged underwater spur, which slashed a 300-foot gash in the hole below the ship's waterline. Soon after touring the damage, the ship was given an hour to stay afloat, and the lifeboats were instructed to be loaded. The loading went completely wrong, with boats half full being lowered and some not being able to be lowered at all. Three hours later, the Titanic would sink to the bottom of the Atlantic Sea, killing over 1,500 people. April 12, 1861, the American Civil War begins. The bloodiest four years in American history began when Confederate shore batteries under General P.G.T. Beauregard opened fire on a Union-held Fort Sumter in South Carolina's Charleston Bay. During the next 34 hours, 50 Confederate guns and mortars launched more than 4,000 rounds at the poorly supplied fort. On April 13th, U.S. Major Robert Anderson surrendered the fort. Two days later, U.S. President Abraham Lincoln issued a proclamation calling for 75,000 volunteer soldiers to quell the Southern insurrection. As early as 1858, the ongoing conflict between North and South over the issue of slavery had led to Southern leadership to discuss a unified separation from the United States. 
By 1860, the majority of the slave states were publicly threatening secession if the Republicans, the anti-slavery party, won the presidency. The following Republican Abraham Lincoln's victory over the divided Democratic Party in November 1860, South Carolina immediately initiated secession proceedings. On December 20th, the South Carolina legislature passed the Ordinance of Secession, which declared that the Union now subsisting between South Carolina and other states under the name of the United States of America is hereby dissolved. After the declaration, South Carolina set about seizing forts, arsenals, and other strategic locations within the state. Within six weeks, five more southern states, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, and Louisiana had followed South Carolina's lead. In February 1861, delegates from those states convened to establish a unified government. Jefferson Davis of Mississippi was subsequently elected as the first president of the Confederate States of America. When Abraham Lincoln was inaugurated on March 4, 1861, a total of seven states had seceded from the Union, the federal troops held only Fort Sumter in South Carolina, Fort Pickens off the coast of Florida, and a handful of minor outposts in the South. Four years after the Confederate attack on Fort Sumter, the Confederacy was defeated at the total cost of 620,000 Union and Confederate soldiers dead. January 30th, 1933, Adolf Hitler is sworn in as Chancellor of Germany. The year 1932 had seen Hitler's meteoric rise to prominence in Germany, spurred largely by the German people's frustration with the dismal economic conditions and the still festering wounds inflicted by the defeat in the World War I and the harsh peace terms of the Versailles Treaty. A charismatic speaker, Hitler channeled popular discontent with the post-war Weimar government into support for his fledgling Nazi party. In an election held in July 1932, the Nazis won 230 governmental seats. Together with the Communists, the next largest party, they made up over half of the Reichstag. Hitler's emergence as Chancellor on January 30, 1933 marked a crucial turning point for Germany and ultimately for the world. His plan, embraced by much of the German population, was to do away with politics and make Germany a powerful, unified, one-party state. He began immediately, ordering a rapid expansion of the state police, the Gestapo, and putting Hermann Göring in charge of a new security force composed entirely of Nazis and dedicated to stamping out whatever opposition to his party might arise. From that moment on, Nazi Germany was off and running, and there was little anyone could do to stop it. November 7th, 1917, The Bolshevik Revolution Led by Bolshevik party leader Vladimir Lenin, Leftist revolutionaries launched a nearly bloodless coup d'etat against Russia's ineffectual provisional government. The Bolsheviks and their allies occupied government buildings and other strategic locations in the Russian capital of Petrograd, now St. Petersburg, and within two days had formed a new government with Lenin at its head. Bolshevik Russia, later renamed the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, was the world's first Marxist state. After the outbreak of the February Revolution, Lenin called to overthrow the provisional government by the Soviets. In July, he was forced to flee to Finland, but his call for peace, land, and bread met with increasingly popular support and the Bolsheviks won a majority in the Petrograd Soviet. In October, Lenin secretly returned to Petrograd, and on November 6th through the 8th, the Bolshevik-led Red Guards disposed the provisional government and proclaimed Soviet rule. Lenin became the virtual dictator of the first Marxist state in the world. His government made peace with Germany, nationalized industry, and distributed land, but beginning in 1918 had to fight a devastating civil war against Tsarist forces. In 1920, the Tsarists were defeated, and in 1922, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics was established. Upon Lenin's death in early 1924, his body was embalmed and placed in a mausoleum near the Moscow Kremlin. Petrograd was then renamed Leningrad in his honor. After a struggle for succession, fellow revolutionary Joseph Stalin succeeded Lenin as the leader of the Soviet Union. November 13th, 2015 The November 2015 Paris Attacks On November 13th, 2015, a cell of the Islamic State of Iraq commits a string of terrorist attacks across Paris, killing 131 and injuring over 400 people. It was the deadliest day in France since World War II, as well as the deadliest operation ISIL had carried out in Europe to date. The attacks on this day began with a series of suicide bombings outside the Stade de France, where the French national soccer team was playing Germany with President Francois Hollande in attendance. 
One person was killed, but further bloodshed was averted because the bombers failed to enter the stadium. The stadium attack was immediately followed by a string of shootings and another bombing at restaurants closer to the city center, culminating in a massacre and hostage taking at the Bataclan Theater in the middle of a sold out rock concert. After more than two hours, the French police stormed the theater, resulting in the deaths of three assailants. As the citizens of France mourned, its government declared a state of emergency and had stepped up its bombing campaign against ISIL. On November 18th, one of a series of police raids across the region resulted in the death of Abdel Hamid Aboud, the alleged mastermind of the attack. Aboud held dual Belgian and Moroccan citizenship, while seven of the nine Paris attackers were either Belgian or French. The perpetrators had tied to ISIL's Brussels cell, which coordinated a number of attacks in Europe, including a string of suicide bombings in the Belgian capital the following March. Though a number of ISIL-inspired stabbings and attacks, usually by one or two isolated perpetrators, occurred across France throughout 2016 and 2017, the Paris attacks represent the high watermark for ISIL's activities in Europe. December 26, 1991 The Dissolution of the Soviet Union by December 25, 1991, Mikhail Gorbachev was a president without a country. Three of the Soviet Union's 15 republics had already declared independence, and days earlier the leaders of 11 others agreed to leave the USSR to form the Commonwealth of Independent States. Once the republic leaders signed the Soviet Union's virtual death warrant, all that was left was for Gorbachev to pull the plug. So in a 10-minute televised speech on the night of December 25th, Aware Gorbachev addressed a nation that no longer existed. He announced the dissolution of the Soviet Union in his resignation as the eighth and final leader. The Soviet Union was dead at the age of 69. The downfall of the USSR started with Mikhail Gorbachev and the new reform that he brought in. He ushered political openness, glasnost, and economic restructuring, perestroika, which loosened government control on the Soviet economy and permitted limited private enterprise. These were good overall but started to lead to a divide of people who wanted greater freedoms and people who wanted to end the reforms altogether. Boris Yeltsin was particularly radical, wanting Gorbachev to resign after the Soviet army cracked down on republics wanting sovereignty. In March 1991, the USSR held a public referendum to determine whether the Soviet Union should be preserved or dissolved. This led to nothing and the Democrats kept pushing for more radical reforms, much to the dismay of Gorbachev. A coup was attempted in August 1991 after Gorbachev was placed under house arrest and when he was released Yeltsin was seen as the hero of the country. On December 8th, Gorbachev met with the leaders of Belarus and Ukraine at a villa outside Minsk and signed an agreement to form the Commonwealth of Independent States. By the time he announced the end of the USSR on the night of December 25th, Yeltsin had already taken control of everything, even the presidential office. There were no gunshots when the USSR fell, no fighting just the red flag of the Soviet Union slowly brought down, with the Russian Federation flag taking its place. July 14th, 1789 The Storming of the Bastille Parisian revolutionaries and mutinous troops storm and dismantle the Bastille, a royal fortress and prison that had come to symbolize the tyranny of the Bourbon monarchs. This dramatic action signaled the beginning of the French Revolution. A decade of political turmoil and terror in which King Louis XVI was overthrown and tens of thousands of people, including the king and his wife Marie Antoinette, were executed. By the summer of 1789, France was moving quickly towards revolution. Bernard René Jordan Delaunay, the military governor of Bastille, feared that his fortress would be a target for the revolutionaries and requested reinforcements. On July 12th, royal authorities transferred 250 barrels of gunpowder to the Bastille, and Lonnie brought his men into the massive fortress and raised its two drawbridges. At dawn on July 14th, a great crowd armed with muskets, swords, and various makeshift weapons began to gather around the Bastille. Lonnie's men were able to hold the mob back, but as more and more Parisians were converging on the Bastille, Lonnie raised a white flag of surrender over the fortress. Lonnie and his men were taken into custody, the Bastille's gunpowder and cannons were seized, and the seven prisoners were freed. Upon arriving at the Hotel de Ville, where Lonnie was to be arrested and tried by a revolutionary council, he was instead pulled away by a mob and murdered. The capture of the Bastille symbolized the end of the Ancien Regime and provided the French revolutionary cause with an irresistible momentum. In 1792, the monarchy was abolished. And in 1793, King Louis and Marie Antoinette were convicted of treason and sentenced to death by the guillotine. August 24th, 79 AD, 
Mount Vesuvius erupts. On August 24, 79 AD, after centuries of dormancy, Mount Vesuvius erupts in southern Italy, devastating the prosperous Roman cities of Pompeii and Herculeum and killing thousands. The cities, buried under a thick layer of volcanic material and mud, were never rebuilt and were largely forgotten in the course of history. In the 18th century, Pompeii and Herculeum were rediscovered and excavated, providing an unprecedented archaeological record of everyday life in an ancient civilization, startlingly preserved in sudden death. Pompeii and Herculaneum were cities that were near the base of Mount Vesuvius at the Bay of Naples. The surrounding land had extremely fertile soil and was populated with numerous vineyards and orchids. Life was normal until August 24, 79 AD, when Mount Vesuvius erupted, with poisonous volcanic gas and ash engulfing the cities and killing all that stayed behind instead of fleeing. It wouldn't be until the 18th century when a well digger would find a marble statue from Herculaneum, and in 1748 a farmer found traces of Pompeii beneath his very own vineyard. Skeletal remains were found at both locations, and archaeologists were able to piece together everyday life with more and more of the cities being discovered. To date, Mount Vesuvius is the only active volcano on the European mainland. Its last eruption was in 1944, and its last major eruption was in 1631. Another eruption is expected in the near future, which could be devastating for the 700,000 people who live in the death zones near Vesuvius. July 14, 2015 the New Horizons spacecraft approaches Pluto. At 11.49 Universal Time, July 14, 2015, the New Horizons spacecraft flew about 4,800 miles above the surface of Pluto. About 13 hours later, at 53 Universal Time, July 15, a 15-minute series of status messages were received at mission operations at John Hopkins University, confirming that the flyby had been fully successful. This was the first time in history that we were able to see Pluto and get an accurate size of the planet. Besides collecting data on Pluto, New Horizons also observed Pluto's other satellites, Nix, Hydra, Kerabos, and Styx. Data from the New Horizons clearly indicated that Pluto and its satellites were far more complex than imagined, and scientists were particularly surprised by the degree of current activity on Pluto's surface. The atmospheric haze and the lower than predicted atmospheric escape rate forced scientists to fundamentally revise earlier models of the system. Pluto, in fact, displays evidence of vast changes in atmospheric pressure and possibly had running or standing liquid volatiles on its surface in the past. There are hints that Pluto could have an internal water ice ocean today. November 21st, 1905, Albert Einstein publishes his famous equation. Albert Einstein's paper, Does the Inertia of a Body Depend on Its Energy Content, was published in the journal Annalen der Physik on November 21, 1905. The paper revealed the relationship between energy and mass that would eventually lead to the mass-energy equivalence formula, E equals mc squared. Einstein was far from being the first to propose a mass-energy relationship, but he was the first scientist to propose the E equals mc squared formula, and the first to interpret mass-energy equivalence as a fundamental principle that follows from the relativistic symmetries of space and time. November 9th, 1938 Kristallnacht On November 9th to November 10th, 1938, in an incident known as Kristallnacht, Nazis in Germany torched synagogues, vandalized Jewish homes, schools, and businesses, and killed close to 100 Jews. In the aftermath of Kristallnacht, also called the Night of Broken Glass, some 30,000 Jewish men were arrested and sent to Nazi concentration camps. German Jews had been subjected to repressive policies since 1933, when Nazi party leader Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany. However, prior to Kristallnacht, these Nazi policies had been primarily non-violent. After Kristallnacht, conditions for German Jews grew increasingly worse. During World War II, Hitler and the Nazis implemented their so-called final solution to what they referred as the Jewish problem and carried out the systematic murder of some 60 million European Jews in what came to be known as the Holocaust. In the fall of 1938, Herschel Grinspan was a 17-year-old Polish Jew living in France who was upset at learning that the Nazis had exiled his parents to Poland from Hanover, Germany. Infuriated, he shot a German diplomat in France named Ernest von Rath, who died of his wounds two days later. Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi minister for public enlightenment and propaganda, immediately seized on the assassination to rile Hitler's supporters into an anti-Semitic frenzy. Kristallnacht was the result of that rage. Starting in the late hours of November 9th and continuing into the next day, 
Nazi mobs torched or otherwise vandalized hundreds of synagogues throughout Germany and damaged, if not completely destroyed, thousands of Jewish homes, schools, businesses, hospitals, and cemeteries. Nearly 100 Jews were murdered during the violence. Nazi officials ordered German police officers and firemen to do nothing as riots raged and buildings burned, although firefighters were allowed to extinguish blazes that threatened the Aryan-owned property. In the immediate aftermath of Kristallnacht, the streets of Jewish communities were littered with broken glass from vandalized buildings, giving rise to the name Night of Broken Glass. The Nazis held the German Jewish community responsible for the damage and imposed a collective fine upwards of 400 million in today's rates, according to the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. Additionally, more than 30,000 Jewish men were arrested and sent to the Dachau, Buchenwald, and Sachsenhausen concentration camps in Germany. Camps that were specifically constructed to hold Jews, political prisoners, and other perceived enemies of the Nazi state. April 20th, 1889 The Birth of Adolf Hitler Adolf Hitler was born on April 20th, 1889 in Braunau, a small Austrian town near the Austro-German frontier. After his father, Alois, retired as a state customs official, young Adolf spent most of his childhood in Linz, the capital of Upper Austria. Not wanting to follow in his father's footsteps as a civil servant, he began struggling in secondary school and eventually dropped out. Alois died in 1903, and Adolf pursued his dream of being an artist, although he was rejected from Vienna's Academy of Fine Arts. After his mother, Clotta, died in 1908, Hitler moved to Vienna, where he pieced together a living, painting scenery and monuments and selling the images. Lonely, isolated, and a vicarious reader, Hitler became interested in politics during his years in Vienna, and developed many of his ideas that would shape Nazi ideology. Hitler was involved in World War I, earning the Iron Cross first class in the process. He was wounded twice in the war, first after getting shot in the leg, and second after being temporarily blinded by a British gas attack. He learned of Germany's defeat while healing in a hospital. Like many Germans, Hitler came to believe the country's devastating defeat could be attributed not to the Allies, but to the insufficiently patriotic traitors at home, a myth that would undermine the post-war Weimar Republic and set the stage for Hitler's rise. December 18, 1878 The Birth of Joseph Stalin Joseph Stalin was born Josef Vizarionovich Dugashvili on December 18, 1878, in the small town of Gori, Georgia, then part of the Russian Empire. When he was in his 30s, he took the name Stalin, which means Man of Steel in Russian. Born into poverty, Stalin became involved in revolutionary politics, as well as criminal activities as a young man. After Bolshevik leader Vladimir Lenin died, Stalin outmaneuvered his rivals for control of the party. Once in power, he collectivized farming and had potential enemies executed or sent to forced labor camps called gulags. Stalin aligned with the United States and Britain in World War II, but afterwards engaged in an increasingly tense relationship with the West known as the Cold War. After his death, the Soviets initiated the de-Stalinization process. December 26, 2004, the Indian Ocean Earthquake and Tsunami a powerful earthquake off the coast of Sumatra, Indonesia, on December 26, 2004, sets off a tsunami that wreaks death and devastation across the Indian Ocean coastline. The quake was the second strongest ever recorded, and the estimated 230,000 dead made this disaster one of the top 10 worst of all time. It was 7.58 AM when the tremendous quake struck beneath the Indian Ocean 160 miles west of Sumatra. Not only did it register at approximately a 9.3 magnitude and lasted nearly 10 minutes, the quake moved a full 750 miles of underwater fault line earth up to 40 feet. The movement of the earth caused a massive displacement of water. It is estimated that the resulting tsunami had two times the energy of all the bombs used during World War II. Within 15 minutes, tsunami waves were crashing the coast of Sumatra. At the north end of the island was a heavily populated area known as the Ak. There, the waves reached 80 feet high over large stretches of the coast and up to 100 feet in some places. Entire communities were simply swept away by the water in a matter of minutes. The death toll in Indonesia is estimated at between 130,000 and 160,000 people, with an additional 500,000 people left homeless. About a third of the victims were children. The huge waves missed the coast of Indonesia on the north side and went on to Thailand, where between 5,000 and 8,000 people died. The tsunami also moved east across the Indian Ocean. 
In Sri Lanka, the tsunami came ashore about 90 minutes after the earthquake. Although the waves were not as high as in Auk, they still brought disaster. Approximately 35,000 people lost their lives and half a million others lost their homes. In addition, about 15,000 people died in India. The killer waves even reached 5,000 miles away in South Africa, where two people died. In total, 190,000 people are confirmed dead, with another 40,000 to 45,000 missing and presumed dead. Although billions of dollars of humanitarian aid poured into the affected regions in the aftermath of the disaster, an estimated 7 billion within the first 18 months, some heirs continue to suffer from the massive devastation. April 24th, 1915 the Armenian Genocide The Armenian Genocide was the systematic killing and deportation of Armenians by the Turks of the Ottoman Empire. In 1915, during World War I, leaders of the Turkish government set in a motion plan to expel and massacre Armenians. By the early 1920s, when the massacres and deportations finally ended, between 600,000 and 1.5 million Armenians were dead, with many more forcibly removed from the country. Today, most historians call this event a genocide, a premeditated and systematic campaign to exterminate an entire people. However, the Turkish government still does not acknowledge the scope of these events. The Ottoman Empire had a distaste for the Armenian people for centuries, mainly out of jealousy due to the Armenians becoming more successful than the Turks. As World War I grew, the Turks took the opportunity to start a mass exodus of the Armenian people. On April 24th, 1915, the Armenian Genocide began. That day, the Turkish government arrested and executed several hundred Armenian intellectuals. After that, ordinary Armenians were turned out of their homes and sent on death marches through the Mesopotamian desert without food or water. Frequently, the marchers were stripped naked and forced to walk under the scorching sun until they dropped dead. People who stopped to rest were shot. These killing squads were often made up of murderers and other ex-convicts. They drowned people in rivers, threw them off cliffs, crucified them, and burned them alive. In short order, the Turkish countryside was littered with Armenian corpses. The reports vary. Most sources agree that there were about 2 million Armenians in the Ottoman Empire at the time of the massacre. In 1922, when the genocide was over, there were just 388,000 Armenians remaining in the Ottoman Empire. Ever since then, the Turkish government has denied that a genocide ever took place. They've argued that the Armenians were an enemy force and that their slaughter was a necessary war measure. August 26th 1883, the eruption of Krakatoa. Krakatoa is a small volcanic island in Indonesia, located about 100 miles west of Jakarta. On August 26, 1883, the eruption of the main island of Krakatoa killed more than 36,000 people, making it one of the most devastating volcanic eruptions in human history. Around 1 p.m. on August 26, a volcanic blast sent a cloud of gas and debris some 50 miles into the air above Purba Watan. It would be the first in a series of increasingly powerful explosions over the next 21 hours, culminating in a gigantic blast at around 10 a.m. on August 27th that propelled some ash 50 miles into the air and could be heard as far away as Perth, Australia. Krakatoa's violent eruption killed more than 36,000 people. Relatively few of the victims were killed by the volcanic rock and hot volcanic gases produced by the blast themselves. Tens of thousands of people drowned in a series of tsunamis caused by the volcano's collapse into the caldera, including a 120-foot high wall of water that formed just after the climatic blast and wiped out at least 165 coastal villages along Java and Sumatra. The 1883 Krakatoa eruption measured a 6 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index with the force of 200 megatons of TNT. By comparison, the bomb that destroyed the Japanese city of Hiroshima in 1945 had a force of 20 kilotons, or nearly 10,000 times less power. Dense clouds immediately lowered the temperatures in the immediate area. As the dust spread according to later studies, the eruption likely caused a drop in average global temperatures for several years. In late 1927, Krakatoa reawakened, producing steam and debris. In early 1928, the rim of a new cone appeared above sea level, and it grew into a small island within a year. Called Anak Krakatoa, Child of Krakatoa, the island has continued to grow to an elevation of some 1,000 feet and erupts mildly at times. An eruption on March 31st, 2014 measured a 1 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index. April 7th, 1994, the Rwandan Genocide. During the Rwandan Genocide of 1994, 
Members of the Hutu ethnic majority in the eastern central African nation of Rwanda murdered as many as 800,000 people, mostly of the Tutsi minority. Started by Hutu nationalists in the capital of Kigali, the genocide spread throughout the country with shocking speed and brutality, as ordinary citizens were incited by local officials and the Hutu power government to take up arms against their neighbors. By the time the Tutsi-led Rwandese Patriotic Front gained control of the country through a military offensive in early July, hundreds of thousands of Rwandans were dead, and two million refugees fled Rwanda, exaggerating what had already become a full-blown humanitarian crisis. On April 6, 1994, a plane carrying Rwanda's president Juvenal Habir Mana and Burundi's president Sapir and Netir Mira was shot down over the capital city of Kigali, leaving no survivors. Within an hour of the plane crash, the Presidential Guard, together with members of the Rwandan Armed Forces and the Hutu militia groups known as the Interahamwe, those who attack together, and the Puza Mugabe, those who have the same goal, set up roadblocks and barricades and begin slaughtering Tutsis and moderate Hutus with impunity. The genocidal killings officially began a day later on April 7th, with notable victims being Hutu Prime Minister Agathe Owenigimana and 10 Belgian peacekeepers. The mass killings in Kigali quickly spread from that city to the rest of Rwanda. In the first two weeks, local administrators in central and southern Rwanda, where most Tutsis lived, resisted the genocide. After April 18th, national officials removed the resistors and killed several of them. Other opponents then fell silent or actively led the killings. Officials rewarded killers with food, drink, drugs, and money. Government-sponsored radio stations started calling on ordinary Rwandan civilians to murder their neighbors. Within three months, some 800,000 people had been slaughtered. In the aftermath of the Rwandan genocide, many prominent figures on the international community lamented the outside world's general obliviousness to the situation and its failure to act in order to prevent the atrocities from taking place. As former UN Secretary General Boutros Boutros Ghali told the PBS news program Frontline, the failure of Rwanda is 10 times greater than the failure of Yugoslavia. Because in Yugoslavia the international community was interested, it was involved. In Rwanda, nobody was interested. April 28, 1789. Mutiny on the HMS Bounty the HMS Bounty was a ship sent out on December 1787 to gather breadfruit saplings to transport to the West Indies. The crew landed in Tahiti on October 1788 and spent five months there, enjoying the climate and hospitality from the locals. On April 4th, the Bounty left to head to the West Indies as planned. On April 28th, however, near the island of Tonga, the mutiny began, with Fletcher Christian and 25 petty officers and seamen seizing the HMS Bounty from William Bly, the ship's captain. They sent him off in a longboat to the sea, took the Bounty back to Tahiti, gathered the locals, and took off to find a safer island to inhabit. They landed on the island of Pitcairn and made a small civilization there, where the descendants live there to this very day. The story of the mutiny has been adapted into multiple Hollywood films, such as Mutiny on the Bounty in 1962, starring Trevor Howard and Marlon Brando, and The Bounty in 1984, starring Anthony Hopkins and Mel Gibson. Today, just a few dozen live on the Pitcairn Island, with most of them all being descendants of the Bounty mutineers. March 27, 1977, Tenerife Airport Disaster On March 27, 1977, two Boeing 747 passenger jets, KLM Flight 4805 and Pan Am Flight 1736 collided on the runway at the Los Rodeos Airport on the Spanish island of Tenerife. The collision resulted in 583 dead passengers and is the deadliest aviation accident in history. The events that led up to the accident were nothing short of pure negligence and coincidence, and there were many instances where the devastation could have been completely avoided. Earlier that very day, a terrorist group set off a bomb in the Grand Canary's Las Palmas airport terminal, causing injuries and panic. The flights were delayed as a result of this, with the airport and planes being searched for any other bombs. Once the delay was over, both planes ended up on opposite ends on the same runway, now full of fog so thick that the planes and air traffic control couldn't see each other, all while having no ground radar to help with the visuals. Miscommunications on who's supposed to take off first and the impatience of KLM Captain Jacob Von Zetten beginning his takeoff role before giving clearance by air traffic control led to the KLM colliding with the top of the Pan Am 747, killing all of the KLM passengers and most of the Pan Am passengers. 
In the aftermath of the disaster, a memorial was made for those who were fallen and a ground radar was installed in a new airport built nearby. January 23, 1961 A Close Call Over North Carolina On January 23, 1961, a B-52 Stratofortress bomber patrolled the night skies over the Atlantic Ocean. It was three days after the presidential inauguration of John F. Kennedy, and with the Cold War in full freeze, American bombers such as this one carrying a pair of 3.8 megaton Mark 39 hydrogen bombs were kept airborne at all times to defend the country. Many hours had passed since the B-52 took off from Seymour Johnson Air Force Base near Goldsboro, North Carolina, when something suddenly went wrong on the routine Strategic Air Command training mission. Fuel started gushing out of a leak, and during the flight attempt back to Goldsboro, the plane fell apart and the bombs fell out and started heading straight towards Earth. One bomb landed in a field with its parachute entangled in a tree, and another struck right into Earth, entombed in dirt and rock. While the Greensboro record reported of a jet carrying a weapon crashing, the military kept it a secret just how close the accident came to causing a nuclear catastrophe. The bomb that had deployed its parachute in the trees had three of its four switches activated when the military got to it. If the fourth switch were to be on as the bomb landed, nuclear experts estimate that the blast would have instantly killed everything within an 8.5 mile radius. Lethal radiation fallout could have traveled up the Atlantic seaboard and stretched as far as New York. It wasn't until 2013 that the true nature of this event was revealed from declassified information. July 30th, 1975 the disappearance of Jimmy Hoffa. On the morning of July 31, 1975, James Riddle Hoffa, one of the most influential American labor leaders of the 20th century, is officially reported missing after he failed to return home the previous night. Though he is popularly believed to have been the victim of a mafia hit, conclusive evidence was never found and Hoffa's fate remains a mystery. Jimmy Hoffa was the leader of the Teamsters Union and was popular for his charisma and hardworking nature. However, there was more to the Teamsters than what the public knew. Many Teamster leaders partnered with the Mafia in racketeering, extortion, and embezzlement. Hoffa himself had relationships with high-ranking mobsters and was the target of several government investigations through the 1960s. In 1967, he was convicted of bribery and sentenced to 13 years in prison. Released on the condition of not participating in union activities for 10 years, Hoffa was planning to fight this restriction in court when he disappeared on the afternoon of July 30th, 1975, from the parking lot of a restaurant in Detroit, not far from where he got his start as a labor organizer. His family filed a missing persons report to the Bloomfield Township Police the very next day. Several conspiracy theories have been floated about Hoffa's disappearance and the location of his remains, but the truth remains unknown. September 19, 1881 The Death of President James A. Garfield On the morning of July 2, 1881, James A. Garfield arrived at the Baltimore and Potomac train station when a man named Charles Gateau came up behind him and shot him twice, one shot grazing his arm and the other striking him in the lower back, knocking him to the floor. Garfield was immediately rushed from the station to a bedroom in the White House. Doctors feared he might not survive and he ended up spending the next few days fighting hard for his life. At first, he was doing fine, but his condition would slowly worsen as time went on. His doctor, Dr. Wheeler Bliss, administered heavy doses of drugs to ease the pain and even enlisted the help of telephone inventor Alexander Graham Bell to help find the bullet. By September, a massive infection caused by the medical treatment had left Garfield with a persistent fever and abscesses all over his body. He would die on the night of September 19, 1881. He had only been president for 200 days. Were it not for the limitations of 1880s medical knowledge, there's no doubt that he most likely would have lived. February 2nd, 1959, the Dyatlov Pass Incident The Dyatlov Pass Incident was an event in which nine Russian hikers died in the northern Ural Mountains between the 1st and 2nd of February 1959 in uncertain circumstances. The experienced trekking group, who were all from the Ural Polytechnical Institute, had established a camp on the slopes of Kolat Siakol in an area now named in honor of the group's leader, Igor Dyatlov. During the night, something caused them to cut their way out of their tents and flee the campsite while inadequately dressed for the heavy snowfall and sub-zero temperatures. After the group's bodies were discovered, an investigation by Soviet authorities determined that the six had died from hypothermia while the other three had been killed by physical trauma. One victim had major skull damage, two had severe chest trauma, and another had a small crack in the skull. Four of the bodies were found lying in running water in a creek, and three of these had soft tissue damage of the head and face. 
two of the bodies were missing their eyes, one was missing its tongue, and one was missing its eyebrows. The investigation concluded that a compelling natural force had caused the deaths. Numerous theories such as the Yeti and Russian authorities killing them were thrown around. But the most plausible reason for their sudden demise would be a slab avalanche, where unlike a normal avalanche of snow, this is made up of hard slabs of ice. This explains the physical trauma the bodies had on them, which had puzzled many for years. The group was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and it was unfortunate that they went out in such a way. June 30th, 1908 The Tunguska Asteroid Event on the morning of June 30th, 1908, the largest asteroid impact in recorded history occurred in a remote part of Siberia, Russia. The explosion happened over the sparsely populated eastern Siberian taiga, above Siberia's Tunguska River in what is now known as Krenosyarsk Krai. The blast flattened an estimated 80 million trees over an area of 830 square miles of forest. We now celebrate Asteroid Day each year on the anniversary of what is now known as the Tunguska event. Witnesses reported seeing a fireball, a bluish light, as nearly as bright as the sun, moving across the sky, followed by a flash and a sound similar to artillery fire. Along with the sound was a powerful shockwave that broke windows hundreds of miles away and knocked people off their feet. The explosion in the sky was like nothing ever seen before. Even though there was no crater found, it is still categorized as an impact event and is believed to have been caused by an incoming asteroid which never actually struck Earth, but instead exploded into the atmosphere, causing what is known as an airburst, 3-6 to six miles above Earth's surface. The explosion released enough energy to kill reindeer and flatten trees for many miles around the blast site. Today, it is now thought that a small icy comet or stony asteroid collided with Earth's atmosphere that caused the blast. August 31st, 1888, Jack the Ripper begins his spree of murders. Jack the Ripper terrorized London in 1888 killing at least five women and mutilating their bodies in an unusual manner, indicating that the killer had a substantial knowledge of human anatomy. The culprit was never captured, or even identified, and Jack the Ripper remains one of England's, and the world's, most famous criminals. The series Achilles began on August 31st, 1888, but they stood out from the rest of the other violent crime at the time. Marked by sadistic butchery, they suggested of a mind more sociopathic and hateful than most citizens could even comprehend. Jack the Ripper didn't just snuff out life with his knife, he mutilated and disemboweled women, removing organs such as their kidneys and uteruses, and his crimes seemed to portray an abhorrence for the entire female gender. Jack the Ripper's murder suddenly stopped in the fall of 1888, but London citizens continued to demand answers that would not come, even more than a century later. The ongoing case, which has spawned an industry of books, films, TV shows, and historical tours, has met with a number of hindrances, including lack of evidence, a gamut of misinformation and false testimony, and tight regulations by the Scotland Yard. Jack the Ripper has been the topic of news stories for more than 120 years, and will likely continue to be for decades to come. August 15, 1977, The Wow Signal the WOW signal was a strong narrowband radio signal received on August 15, 1977 by Ohio State University's Big Ear Radio Telescope in the United States, then used to support the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. The signal appeared to come from the direction of the constellation Stagatarius and bore the expected hallmarks of extraterrestrial origin. Astronomer Jerry R. Emin discovered the anomaly a few days later while reviewing the recorded data. He was so impressed by the result that he circled the reading on the computer printout 6EQUJ5 and wrote the comment WOW on its side, leading to the event's widely used name. The entire signal sequence lasted for the full 72 second window during which Big Ear was able to observe it, but has not been detected since, despite several subsequent attempts by Edmund and others. Many hypotheses have been advanced on the origin of the admission, including natural and human-made errors, but none of them adequately explain the signal. Although the WOW signal had no detectable modulation, it remains the strongest candidate for an alien radio transmission ever detected. July 9, 1958, Latuya Bay Earthquake and Mega Tsunami the 1958 Latuya Bay earthquake occurred on July 9th at 10.15 p.m. with a magnitude of 7.8 on the Richter scale. The earthquake took place on the Fairweather Fault and triggered a rockside of 40 million cubic yards of dirt into the narrow inlet of Latuya Bay, Alaska. 
The impact was heard 50 miles away, and the sudden displacement of water resulted in a mega tsunami that washed out trees to a maximum elevation of 1,720 feet at the entrance of Gilbert Inlet. This is the largest and most significant mega tsunami in modern times. It forced a re-evaluation of large wave events and the recognition of impact events, rock falls, and landslides as the causes of very large waves. April 11th, 1954, the most boring day in history. The scientist William Tunstall Padot had a search engine project called True Knowledge. The True Knowledge database indexes more than 300 million facts, so William wanted to figure out what the most boring day in history was. The most boring day in history, apparently, was April 11, 1954. The Telegraph notes that, on that day, a general election was held in Belgium. A Turkish academic was born, Professor Abdullah Adalar, and an Oldham athletic footballer called Jack Shufflebotham died. Apart from that, nothing much happened. According to the True Knowledge database, April 11, 1954 is the most boring day in history. Nothing more, nothing less. That is all of the important dates iceberg. I absolutely loved making this iceberg video as I'm a huge fan of historical events and I even recognized a few of these when I first saw the dates, such as Chernobyl and the disappearance of Jimmy Hoffa. Being able to speak about historical events in an iceberg video was a no brainer to me. I can talk about history and make an hour long video about it. It's a win win in my book. It's really really fun learning about all these new things I had never heard of before or never had the time to look into. The Tenerife Airport disaster was something I had never heard of before and reading about it was so interesting. Like the main thing that led to the mishap was out of everybody's control. If it wasn't for that terrorist attack, the flights wouldn't have been delayed and they would have taken off at their normal scheduled times. Those terrorists inadvertently set up the deadliest plane crash in history. Another one I found interesting was the mutiny on the RMS Bounty. It's crazy to think that those descendants are still living on that island to this very day. Like they're their own sort of people, exclusive from the rest of the world. Learning about how brutal the Rwandan genocide was was something I thought I'd never look into. There's so many images of that genocide that I can't show on YouTube. And if you do want to look it up yourself, don't say I didn't warn you. What I'm trying to say is that this iceberg was really great and that I'm glad you guys stopped by and gave it a watch. I hope that you guys found something new that you have never heard of in here interesting. Tell me what your favorite new thing that you learned about in this iceberg in the comments below. I would say overall that mine is the Indian Ocean Tsunami. I remember hearing about it, but I was too young to understand all the chaos and destruction at the time. It sucks to see an event so catastrophic happen, yet I couldn't look away from it because it's just so intriguing to watch. Thank you guys for the support on the channel recently. It's crazy to think that we've managed to get to a thousand subscribers in such a quick time. I wasn't expecting it at all, and I really thank you guys for that. If you would like to support the channel further, you could subscribe, it would be really nice. I also have a Discord channel where you could post your own content as there, and in general just have a good time with everybody. It'd be nice for you guys to join. The link will be in the description below. Again, I thank you guys for making it to the end of the video, and I hope you guys have a great rest of your day, or night. As always, with all of that out of the way, I will see you guys later.